Secret Self Sex Life. Welcome back to the podcast so we can break down if you really need to stop masturbating. That's a big question because when people decide they're going to leave porn behind, they struggle with this one. And so many people, hundreds of people tell me all the time, lots and lots of people tell me all the time, you know, this porn thing, it actually ended up being not as difficult as I thought it was going to be quitting porn. But masturbating. That's another story. I'm having a real hard time leaving masturbation behind. So that's why I'm talking about it this week on the podcast. And what I want us to break down is I want us to think about a study that I'm going to reference. So here's what we're going to talk about. What is involved in your masturbation habit and how is it a reflection of your belief system And is it causing guilt? And that might change along your journey from being a porn consumer to not being a porn consumer because that journey is one of a lifestyle change. So I'm going to challenge you to think about where you are in that journey and where masturbation fits into that formula. So we're going to talk about this study and we're going to talk about those concepts. I'm going to tell you the findings of this story and some of them are really interesting in terms of what masturbation can do to your self-esteem, your self-concept, your mental health, and your relationships. Super interesting. So we're going to break that down. Then, of course, the third thing we're going to talk about today is your brain hack, that how you can decide if masturbation stays in your routines and habits. And if it does, what does it look like? And what are some of those big factors for you to consider uh, if you are thinking about attempting to, yeah, that's a lot of qualifiers, thinking about attempting to create a healthy masturbation meditation habit. So let's dig in. Let's talk about this study. Um, Oh, before we do, I've written myself a note for two caveats so that when people are not a fan of what I'm going to say, or at least some of it, that I have acknowledged these two things. Yes, in fact, I am a woman, but no, that does not disqualify me from talking about masturbation. So if you're really irritated that a woman's talking about healthy versus unhealthy masturbation, that is a really good sign that you can check in on yourself and how you're using masturbation and why you are upset about a woman talking about how it might not be the healthiest thing because my professional background and The study that I'm about to talk about qualifies me to talk about it. Plus, just being a human qualifies me to talk about masturbation. So we're going to need to get over that one if it's a hang up, if you find this video, Uh, because I'm recording the podcast. I always put the videos on my YouTube channel and it gets served up to some people sometimes. And it's like this is this lady. I'm not listening to this lady about masturbation. Well, what I tell you is going to be pretty interesting. Number two is, in fact, this applies to women. So if you're a woman out there and you're struggling with masturbation, keep listening. Even though I'm going to talk to mostly men because that's who I'm mostly talking to, this applies to you. This is the human experience when it comes to compulsive hypersexuality. Women are not, uh, you know, disqualified from this conversation Nobody should be disqualified from this conversation just because of their gender or their sex. So stay with me because this is important. Okay, two caveats out of the way. Moving on. Okay, so do you really need to stop masturbating? Let's talk about this study. So this study is actually by Castellini et al., and it was in the Journal of Sex Medicine. I will put the link in the YouTube channel video if you're looking for it. But what they did was they studied men who were in an andrology and sex medicine clinic. Now, I love this because this isn't just the general population. This is part of the conversation. This is talking about men who went to a men's sexual health clinic because they were having sexual health issues. So at the end of the study, what they reference is that compulsive sexual behavior is a thing and it's impacting men and that part of the takeaway of the study is being aware that compulsive sexuality and masturbation as part of it is real. So what I like about the subjects or the participants of the study being in a sex medicine clinic is that this study talks about men who are struggling with sexuality and specifically 
they found out about their masturbation habits and what are involved. And those are the findings I'm going to talk about. So this is really pertinent when we talk about compulsive masturbation. Just to break that down for a second, compulsive sexual behavior disorder is recognized in the International Classification of Diseases, the most recent 11th revision. It's recognized as a dis-ease not ease in the nervous system is what that means to me. It is a way that your nervous system manifests that it's having challenges. It's real. It's recognized by the World Health Organization that puts out the ICD. So this is a real thing. This isn't my opinion. This is being recognized globally by the World Health Organization as an issue, and it's becoming an issue for more and more people. But that being said, if Dear listener, you're listening to me and you're like, I've hardly ever masturbated ever and I think masturbation's fine and it doesn't impact my self-esteem and I have zero guilt about it. It's not impacting my relationship. I do not suffer from erectile dysfunction. Then you may not have a compulsive masturbation habit. That's part of figuring this out. That's part of what we're going to do here today. So get your journals out. Because that's what we're figuring out. If you struggle with compulsive masturbation, it's different than if you've never really cared about masturbating your whole life. And when we enter into the conversation about porn use, when you found porn when you were young and you coupled it with masturbation when you were younger, what happens is your brain was linked to porn and masturbation for self-soothing of dealing with uncomfortable emotions or feelings. So that's when compulsive masturbation, the seeds were planted back when you discovered porn and masturbation. And it's linked in your brain in a different way than someone who just casually finds masturbation exploring their body one time and never goes back to it. Compulsion means there is a need to go to that behavior to create some sense of calmness in the nervous system. So you act in a way that helps to try to offset the uncomfortable feelings inside. That's what a compulsion is. It's a dependency. You're pushed towards it. It's not a thing that's like here or there. You just don't care about it. So we are differentiating what I'm going to call casual masturbation versus compulsive masturbation. Very important distinction. So the first hack that we're going to get to in the brain hacks, but I'm going to introduce it to you now is thinking about when did your masturbation habits start? Has it been something that you've consistently gone to? Was it coupled to pornography? Is it something that you use for stress reduction and to alleviate boredom? Does it have consistency? Does it have frequency? And if so, then likely it's compulsive masturbation. If you've been doing it for decades, if you've been doing it once a week, once every other week, two times a month, that's still a consistent habit that you're likely using for mood regulation and it falls into compulsive masturbation. So think about those things as we keep going. Okay, so I covered that compulsive masturbation is a real thing. It's recognized by the World Health Organization. So in this study, they are talking about what they refer to as ego dystonic masturbation, EM. That's a mouthful. But their their definition is that basically it's masturbation that causes guilt. And the reason is because what ego dystonic means is that your behavior is out of sync with your belief system. And we know that this is a major player, a major factor when it comes to porn consumption is that you watch porn, but then that's not something that you see as a good behavior. And I I don't love to use the word good. So you don't see it as something you want to be doing and it produces guilt and it produces shame. It makes you feel unworthy. It makes you feel like a bad person. That's what shame is. I am bad. Guilt is I'm doing something that I don't want to that is bad. So ego dystonic means that you are doing a behavior that's out of sync of your belief system. So I'd like you to check in on that because that's going to be part of the brain hack also. So the opposite of that is ego syntonic. And that means that your behaviors are in sync with what you believe. And I refer to that as integrity. So if you're creating integrity and dignity in your life and you're always acting in accordance with your healthy value system, 
So I don't think of good and bad and right and wrong. I think of healthy and unhealthy. So if you're acting in a way that is healthy, because honestly, I check in with myself on this stuff all the time. I'm like, I feel right. But just because I think it's good or that it, it seems right to me, I have to, I literally will check in with myself and go, okay, like, is this a healthy behavior or is this unhealthy of me? And, you know, especially when you are in an unhealthy place, it's difficult for you to um, know if it's healthy or unhealthy. That's when you need someone to mirror it back to you. That's why coaching can be so powerful. That's why I have programs. That's why I offer group coaching. That's why Zach, who's on my team and my team of coaches offers coaching so that when you show up, it's like, mm, is that behavior healthy or unhealthy? Because a lot of times you can't see those unhealthy behaviors when you're when you're caught up in them. So when it's egocentric, it measures up with your value system. So if you're acting out and you're using pornography or you're masturbating or you're acting out in another sexual acting out way, and it is not in alignment with what you think about a good person being or what you want to be doing for yourself, it creates ego dystonic. We're talking about ego dystonic masturbation, masturbation that creates guilt. Now, in this study, what they found is that a percentage of the people were found to have EM, ego dystonic masturbation. And the interesting thing about it is that those people felt differently about the masturbation. So they felt more guilty. Now, this is the interesting thing. And I'm going to, the cool, well, the interesting finding, I guess, is that I'm getting on my list so I don't forget to say something is that there was a higher percentage of dissociation in those people. They dissociated more. There was much more depression. Interestingly, there was less anxiety, but more depression and less OCD behaviors. OCD comes out of the anxiety brain pattern. So it was more that it kind of slowed down and overwhelmed the nervous system and created more of that slowing in the brain, which when the brain slows down, it's going to be even more eager for stimulation. So depression is a slow brain pattern. Um, it required more alcohol intake. So there was higher alcohol intake in the men who had guilt after masturbating. And we know alcohol is another way of self-medicating. There were higher instances of erectile dysfunction, which leads us into what there was lower of. There was lower partner climax and there was lower ability to achieve erection and to stay aroused. So in the study, the men who felt guilty about masturbation ended up having more psychological issues, depression, more alcohol use, dissociation, and had more partner and relational problems. And when erectile dysfunction enters into the conversation, we know what happens is performance anxiety increases. And then if there's all this weirdness within your sex life and seemingly or hopefully trying to have a healthy sex life with your partner, if it becomes strained because of performance issues and then your partner's not climaxing, pretty soon it's not fun for anybody, which unfortunately leads you back into the screen and leads you back towards masturbation because it does feel good and because it's self-reliant. So it is a secret sex life, hence the title of this podcast. And we're going to break that down in just a second. So it becomes a self-sex life. And many times it happens in secret because it's not shared with your partner. So let's let's go with self-sex life for a second, then we'll get to secret. Self-sex sex life is you have another sex life on top of the one that you have with your partner. So there's the sex that you and your partner have, and then you have this whole other thing that you do that your partner is not aware of, and that doesn't require anybody to be involved. And so that is the seeming beauty of porn and masturbation that makes it so easy for you to go back to. And, you know, again, going back to the comments on the YouTube channel, a lot of men will write, why would I ever bother with a partner who can tell me no? And, and not a lot, but some people will go, or, you know, in the end, she's going to take my money. And I always write back, healthy partners, first of all, like, want to be with you. If, if the sex life is fun, they want to be with you. If it's engaging, if 
there's connection, if it's, you know, has arousal for both partners and everybody's having a good time and it's has connection, it has dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. It's not just giving you pleasure the whole time and more dopamine, more, more, more. Dopamine is the pleasure seeking neurochemical that's insatiable at high levels. So if you're, you've taught your brain that you can get more physical stimulation from masturbation and more mental stimulation from using pornography, now your brain is getting so much dopamine that being with your partner cannot possibly get you aroused. Hence, you have the erectile dysfunction. Your partner's thrown off because she may perceive that she's being used as an object for your pleasure. And I know a lot of, pe- par- a lot of partners do feel that way because I talk to them. They can sense that they're just being used for your pleasure and they're not that into that, which means then they don't climax, which is what this study shows. And that creates relational problems, psychological issues and relational issues, self sex life on the side. So clearly if you have a really rampant self sex life and your partnered relational sex life is suffering, that is out of balance. That's not healthy. Okay, let's address the secret piece and then we'll break it down even further. Secret. Secrets breed guilt and shame. So if you're keeping a secret from someone, especially if that someone is supposed to be your partner in crime, the person that you vowed to share your life with, except for in the vow, you're like, I'm going to share my life with you, except for this secret self sex life I have going on. I'm not going to share that with you. That creates guilt and shame. That means you're not being vulnerable with your partner. And I know it's strange and I know it's weird. And communication and interaction is a huge piece of this transformational journey. But if you're going to have a self sex life, it should be shared that that is something that you're doing. Because when you share a life with someone and if your partner's assumption, and I know there's a lot of things to break down here, but if the assumption is that sex is something to be shared, but now you have this thing on the side and your partner doesn't know for one year, two year, five years, a decade, four decades, that creates a lot of animosity and contention within a relationship. So if you're going to do it, share it. And your partner will have to learn how to respect and honor what you have going on. And I know it becomes even loaded because it involves sex, but it's just like if it was money. So if you were keeping a whole huge stash of money on the side and your partner didn't know about it, and I know a lot of people do this also, and you keep this stash of money and your partner doesn't have any idea, that still can breed guilt and shame. Unless that's the way that you have set up your relationship in the beginning. Like, you know, our finances are shared to this extent. And beyond that, I'm going to keep these stashes of money for myself. So if your partner knows that, And honestly, I was slightly taught to do that by my father. My father always had stashes of money. He's still alive. I'm sure he still has stashes of money, but he would have stashes of money here and there. And I remember one time I had a Jeep Grand Cherokee and I went to sell it. I was selling the car and I went around all the, you know, little crevices in the car because I would stash money. I owned a restaurant at that time. So I would, two restaurants, I would have to travel between the restaurants. So I always stashed cash in the car because I'd be in the car. Uh, it was a long time ago. And I remember I went through the car before I went to sell it. And I found hundreds of dollars, just money stashed. And it was right when I met my husband. He's like, what is up with you with all this money stashed? And I'm like, I was taught to stash money, my friend. So my husband knows I was taught to stash money. I've been working on not stashing money my whole life. But he'll, he'll, he'll say, he'll go, you know, let's get this. I'm sure you got money stashed somewhere. And, you know, in the times when I didn't, I'd be like, dude, I swear to you, I do not have any money stashed somewhere. But he knows that part of my deal is that it makes me feel good. I'm a five personality type five. If you ever heard me talk about the Enneagram personality types, personality type five has avarice and having stashes of money makes me feel safe. Hence, I have them. But the hubs knows that I have them. I don't keep that from them. It's not this secret You know, I don't always divulge the amount of it. And if he ever wants to know, he'll ask me and I will tell him. But it's part of the deal. He knew that's what he married. He married a girl who stashes money. And I married a dude who does a lot of other things that I knew. And that's part of the deal. So then we can respect and honor what each other brings to this relationship without getting mad about stashes of money. 
it's the same for sex. So if you're stashing sex, but you have not shared with your partner that you're a sex stasher, then when your partner finds out or when your partner vibes it because your sex life is breaking down because there's erectile dysfunction and she's not climaxing and she's like, what the heck's going on? This man's not into me anymore. She has no idea. It's because porn and masturbation are doing it to you. And that's the point of this study is that it will in fact change the way that your brain interacts with healthy sexuality because you're linking yourself to yourself through masturbation and through the higher levels of stimulation. Okay, so let's clearly get to the brain hacks here so that we're not waxing and waning too much. What we've talked about is we know that you, if you struggle with compulsive masturbation, that it can lead to guilt. And that I'm going to talk about that in a second. If it does lead to lead to guilt, it creates psychological self-esteem and relational problems. And then those need a solution. So let's visit the can lead to guilt for one more minute. Then we'll move to the brain hacks. Can lead to guilt is part of that transformational journey. So let's say you just heard my podcast for the first time and you're like, hmm, porn might be bad for me. This lady might be on to something. And you start to learn that porn damages your brain. It creates anxiety and depression. It creates a dopamine deficit in your life and your whole life will be, feel worse to you. And that it creates this relationship issues. And you're like, whoa, I've had, part, I've had problems with my partner for a long time. I thought it was her, but some of it might be coming from me. So now you're understanding the pieces to this thing that porn is definitely not good for you. And if you are using compulsive masturbation to self-soothe, it's part of the problem. And especially if you're starting to feel guilt afterwards because it is the self-sex life that you've been keeping secret, the solution lies where the problem is. And those pieces are part of the issue. So the first thing to check in with in the brain hack is where are you in this understanding of the role that masturbation plays in your life? And is it in fact contributing to some of the challenges that you're experiencing in your mental health, anxiety, depression, lack of motivation in your life? Is it showing up in your physical health? Do you struggle with erectile dysfunction when you are trying to be with your partner? That's what porn-induced or masturbation-induced erectile dysfunction is like when it's time to be with your partner because she doesn't offer this massive, super normal stimulus like porn and masturbation does, you can't do it because you cannot get your brain aroused enough because the reward center in your brain has been desensitized. And now that shows up in your life as a physical performance problem of erectile dysfunction. Is your partner not that into being with you because it's gotten objectified, just using your partner for pleasure. Check in on that. Like, am I just trying to get things done to me? Am I trying just to be, is it porn informed? Am I trying to be like a porn performer and have things done to me and to do things that I want to for the highest amount of pleasure? Not taking into account happiness and connection, serotonin and oxytocin, lower levels of dopamine for pleasure with serotonin and oxytocin, that's the secret sauce that leads to a great sex life that's shared and relational with another partner that doesn't lead you into the secret self sex life of trying to get more and more pleasure as, as consistently as possible. Is the habit compulsive? Do you do it on a schedule? Is it something that you do consistently? Are you using it for mood regulation? Do you use it to upregulate your system in the morning to get yourself going so you can deal with the day? Do you use it to chill out in the evening, to bring yourself back down so that you can sleep? That is a dependency. If you're depending upon it to regulate your brain and to regulate your mood, that's likely an issue. Check in on that. Write about it in your journal. Figure out the role that it plays in your life. Do you feel guilty afterwards? Now, guilt's an interesting thing, and I've talked to a few people this week about it, and I've gotten an email uh, from someone who really jogged this in my mind, is that he just realized that he didn't know he felt guilty when he got done masturbating, but then he'd go interact with his wife, and he would be real snappy and irritable and, and just always annoyed with her, but he realized 
it actually was the feelings of guilt inside. He was feeling bad about doing it. And then it made him angry and he acted out in anger. So he didn't perceive that anger as guilt. He perceived it just as being annoyed at her and that she was to blame. But he just connected the dots because he's been following my videos on YouTube. And he's like, I just figured this out. Like, it's actually guilt. Anytime I masturbate, I become a jerk to her because I'm feeling guilty that I'm doing it and she doesn't know about it. Check in on that so that you can see if there's ego dystonia happening, if it's something that doesn't jive with what you wanted to create in your relationship. What do you do about it if you figure it out? If it's ego dystonic, the solution lies where the problem is. You have to create ego sinking. You have to create the ego syntonic. Make it so that the way that you act is in sync with your belief, your belief system. So what that means is either A, you stop masturbating and hiding it, or two, you share that you, you masturbate. That's a thing you do, and it makes you feel good, and you do it one time a week, and now your partner knows about it, and there might be some backlash about that. There may be some conflict. But again, if it's something that you really want to keep in the mix, at least it's part of the deal. And if you're listening to me and you don't have a partner and you are moving into a partnership, letting your partner know what you are when it comes to money, but we're not really talking about that, and sexuality is important. This is what you get. If, you're, if you want to sign up, this is what you get. Because... The problem lies when you're not being true to that version of yourself, to what you consider to be healthy behavior. Then there is just healthy and unhealthy behavior. So when we look at porn coupled with masturbation, especially if it's compulsive, if you feel the need to do it to feel okay, that's just not healthy for your brain. It means your brain's hooked on it. And whether it makes you feel good or not, sometimes the things that make us feel the best uh, are the things that are the worst for us. One Republic has, you know how I love music, One Republic has a song like, why, why do the things that make me feel good, you know, make me want to die, I think they say. So, you know, that's the idea is that the things that make you feel good, a lot of times are not the things that are good for you. And recognizing that and then making decisions, change the behavior so that it links up with your belief system or modify your belief system to incorporate your behavior. Those are the two choices to be able to make to create ego syntonic feeling. So then you no longer have guilt because if you no longer have guilt that those, those psychological cognitive and physical issues were not associated. The guilt comes from, it doesn't fit into your lifestyle. Okay. So this is a lifestyle change. If you decide you're going to leave porn behind and if you're not going to chronically and consistently compulsively masturbate anymore. It's a lifestyle change. You have to find other ways to offset stress and boredom. That's a huge piece. So this is the last piece of your brain hack. Find other ways to motivate yourself in the morning. Get up, get a great morning routine going, get some tea, some coffee, some lemon water, sit down with a journal. Right now it's summertime where I am and it's gorgeous. Every morning I go out on the back porch. I can hear the birds, the wind in the trees. And I just chill and then I do my meditation that I write in my journal. It gives me such a great dopamine boost for the day. I encourage you to try a great morning routine. Then throughout the day, I have stress regulation activities. Like today, I took a break from working and I went out in the sun. Don't get me wrong. It's a roasty, toasty 90 degrees here in North Carolina, but and humid. It's hot. I was out there in the heat, in the sun, uh, just cranking a workout just for a half hour and then back to it. And I'm wrapping up for the day soon and I'm going to go do some painting with my beautiful daughter and play Bananagrams to relax. And then in the evening, I have an evening routine where I bring it down. Regulate your mood in lots of healthy ways, as many healthy ways as you can think of. And then you won't need porn and masturbation. All right. If you're looking for help on the journey, please reach out to me, drtrishley.com. You'll see that I have a 90-day program that's comprehensive. It helps you move through this transformational journey, get over that ego dystonia um, hump in the middle so that you can transform from ego orientation into your true authentic self. And it would absolutely be my honor to be able to help you in that journey to become the best version of yourself. What I want for you is that you rock out your best life and you have fun doing it because that is what you deserve. Okay, until next time, I'll see you then.